Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or at thetwotestaments.com, where you can also donate to support our work. Follow us on Twitter at the number two testaments on Facebook or Instagram. Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through scripture. I'm Will Kynes. And I'm Ronnie Cosman. And in this episode, we're looking at Matthew chapters 1 to 2, and we're talking to Dr. Richard Hayes. Richard Hayes is the George Washington Ivy Professor Emeritus of New Testament at Duke Divinity School. Uh, He is the author of a number of uh, important works on the New Testament, uh, including Echoes of Scripture in the Gospels, Uh, But he also has a smaller version of this one, if this one is a little bit too daunting, um, which is titled Reading Backwards, Figural Christology and the Fourfold Gospel Witness. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Glad to be with you. A personal story about Richard Hayes is that uh, when I was doing my PhD at Cambridge, uh, and this was back in from 2008 to 2011, uh, I did my PhD on Job's allusions to the Psalms. And you cannot look at intertextuality or allusion in the Bible without engaging with Richard's work, and particularly echoes of scripture of Scripture and the Letters of Paul, which was, I mean, really a formative work in subsequent scholarship on yeah. intertextuality and so forth. Yeah. So yeah. I'm working on this, doing my PhD, and I'm just reading Richard's work and reading articles and books about Richard's work basically all day. Yeah. And then he comes on sabbatical to Tyndale House. And I remember at Tyndale House, they do these um, teas or coffees twice a day. And I remember, you know, reading his work and then walking out to tea. And seeing him there, and I was, you know, an early PhD student, completely intimidated, Mm -hmm. kind of in awe. So I don't know if we actually had a conversation at that point, Richard, because I was just too afraid to walk up and talk to you, which I wish now, looking back, I wish I had, because I'm sure you could have helped me so much in the work that I was doing. (laughs) Um, But I'm grateful that you're taking the time to talk with us now. Uh, And the first question that we like to ask our guests is a little bit of trying to understand their background and how they came to the subject. So you haven't just written on Matthew, you've written on lots of things in the New Testament. What drew you to studying the New Testament? Uh, well, one thing I would say is that um, the first thing that drew me was that when I was an undergraduate, uh, my sophomore year was when I first made a really conscious commitment Uh, to claim my identity as a Christian and to Mm -hmm. follow Jesus. And um, after that, I started thinking, you know, really, I ought to read the Bible a little more than I actually had at that point, even though I had grown up in the church. Uh, So I I spent one summer pouring through uh, the... um, uh, the New English Bible, which was, a, to me, a, a new and unfamiliar translation, which I actually found helpful uh, in, in reading the scripture in a translation that I wasn't familiar with. And uh, I, I still have my little copy of that New English Bible, New Testament, heavily annotated with stars and exclamation points and question marks and and some stupid comments or comments that I now think is <laughs> Uh, So that was kind of the beginning of my delving into it. But then the other thing was that when I first went to seminary and and started into Bible courses where the basic interest of the professors seemed not so much in interpreting the text as it was drilling down into the text to try to discover pretextual sources Mm -hmm. that uh, were um, the background of the text. Uh, I had been an English major as an undergraduate Mm. at Yale, and my first reaction to all of that was to say, what are they doing to these texts? (laughs) This isn't how you read a text. And so uh, it it began a kind of uh, quest on my part to approach the New Testament texts as coherent pieces of literature that demanded to be understood in terms of their unity and integrity. 
Hmm. So uh, that's, a, that's a quick sketch of how I got into doing it. Uh, when yeah. I was thinking about applying to graduate school, I couldn't decide actually whether I wanted to go into theology or New Testament studies. Hmm. And um, I, I decided eventually uh, that I, would, I wanted to go into New Testament studies because I felt that that's where the roots of a lot of problems lay for theology and the church. Uh, so that's that's a quick account of it. Mm-hmm. And um, now we're going to be jumping into Matthew chapters one to two, which are especially dense, right, with citations and allusions, echoes of scripture. And of course, that's an area of New Testament studies, right, in which you have uh, made, let's say, More than a little splash. (laughs) Uh, I mean, you know, Richard, your work has spawned many studies, right? Exploring different echoes in different New Testament books. Um, How did you end up coming to uh, wanting to focus on that in particular, on the New Testament's use of the old? There's actually a simple answer to that question. My first um, teaching job right out of graduate school was uh, at Yale Divinity School. And as the junior professor, I got assigned the job of teaching the intermediate Greek reading course. And I thought, you know, one interesting thing to do in the intermediate reading course would be to have students read uh, New Testament passages alongside passages from the Septuagint, the Greek uh, uh, translation of the Old Testament, and to see how the New Testament writers were using those passages from the Septuagint. Mm. And I, I, I stumbled into that sort of innocently. I, I thought, well, this will this will just be an interesting thing to do. But as, as we started with the class to do that, I kept thinking, what are they, why are they reading it like that? And, mm. and why is it that their quotations don't always line up exactly with the Old mm. Testament passages that they are supposed to be quoting? And um, what sort of a, a, a hermeneutical process is going on there in the way that the New Testament writers are reading the Old Testament? So that's when I started uh, delving into it. And I, w- I would describe the process that I went through as grabbing hold of one end of a rope and you don't know where the rope goes and you sort of go hand over hand over hand trying to follow where it, it might lead and that's that's how I got into doing this and I've been doing it now for uh, the better part of 40 years. <laughs> wow. Uh, what for you in Matthew chapters one to two uh, in these passages? What what do you think is the most difficult aspect of understanding for you in that in that passage? Well, one of them is what I just named. It's it's the fact that Matthew's uh, quotations, of which he has many, where he says this happened in order to fulfill what was written by the prophet, saying. And sometimes the, I'm sure we'll get further down into this, but sometimes it's the way he uses those texts is surprising on the face of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing that's difficult. The other thing I think is difficult to understand is why Matthew chooses to start his gospel with that lengthy genealogy, Mm -hmm. uh, all the names of you know, A begat B and B begat C and so on. Mm -hmm. It goes on and on. Uh, You know, we we tend now to think that a a literary work or a film or whatever should start with some dramatic uh, attention-grabbing thing, you know, a car chase if it's a movie or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, Matthew chooses to start with this incredibly tedious genealogy. (laughs) So uh, (laughs) there are... uh, uh, that's another thing I think that makes Matthew a little off-putting. Right. You know, Richard, it kind of reminds me, actually, the beginning of Star Wars movies, uh-huh. yeah. where the very beginning is all this text you're supposed to read. Yes, yeah, and it's yeah. like, why, why am I slogging through all this in order to get to the, you know, the good stuff? But yeah. There we go. Yeah. And yet that's classic. So, yeah. you know, maybe things yeah. don't always work according to our instincts. Yeah. So how does 
chapters one to two of Matthew, how does it orient us to the rest of the gospel as it follows? I mean, you've mentioned a couple of the features that are prominent in these chapters. We've got a genealogy. We've got a number of quotations or allusions to the Old Testament. What is Matthew doing to get us started as readers for the gospel? Well, I, I think the effect of the things I just mentioned is to emphasize the deep continuity of Israel's story and how the emergence onto uh, the public stage of Jesus has background. There's a backstory, just mm -hmm. like with the Star Wars script that's run on the script. There's a backstory. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very important to see Jesus as Israel's Messiah, as the one who fulfills Israel's hopes. Um, so that, the genealogy has the effect of walking you through the history of Israel from Abraham onwards. Um, and I think that for, for Matthew's community, the people for whom he was writing, that's a very important um, uh, it's a very important consideration that that question of continuity with Israel is probably contested. Um, Matthew's writing in the context where the Christian movement has emerged as as a um, a movement within Judaism, and there are probably many uh, people within Judaism who regard it as. Uh, a novelty and an aberration, something that's perhaps even a betrayal of that history. And Matthew, from start to finish, is concerned that we see this as a surprising, but nonetheless uh, authentic fulfillment of Israel's hopes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start at the top with Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Um, and I'm going to read from the NRSV here. Uh, okay. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, I mean, we could translate it something like the book of the Geneseos, mm -hmm. transliterating that, of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, now, this opening line has of the gospel has multiple deep evocations of Israel's scripture that expects us to know Israel's story, including certain things about Abraham and David and what son of Abraham and son of David signify. What are we supposed to know, you think, uh, from already from this very first line? What do we need to have in mind? Even the evocation, perhaps, of Genesis? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that that phrase, the book of the Genesis, uh, actually is a direct citation or echo of a couple of different passages in the book of Genesis in the Greek translation. It's uh, the first one is Genesis two four. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, and then the second one comes in Genesis five, where it refers to the uh, interestingly the NRSV says the list of the descendants of Adam but mm. the, the Greek mm. is is the book uh, of the or of the Genesis uh, of Adam when God created humankind and so on so it, the, Matthew I think is consciously echoing perhaps both a traditional way of uh, referring to genealogical lists of ancestors, but also picking up the book of Genesis uh, and even suggesting that there, there may be a new Genesis, a, a new creation that is uh, being adumbrated here uh, in, in the story of Jesus. So that's, that's the first thing about it. Okay. I guess the second thing is, is the, the fact that Matthew chooses to describe it, to describe Jesus as son of David, son of Abraham. Um, and there are lots of significations connected with those figures, of course, in Israel's story. Um, son of David is a title for the Messiah, the one who is to be the king of Israel, the one who will restore uh, the kingdom to Israel, to use language that appears later on in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a son of 
Abraham has a couple of interesting meanings, I think. One of them is the one I've already mentioned simply about continuity with the whole long story of Israel. But the other thing that's interesting is that one of the features of Abraham's story that's picked up in the New Testament is that Abraham's uh, descendants are said to be a blessing to all nations, to all the nations. And that, too, is an important theme for Matthew, that Jesus' uh, kingship is not only a restoration of the nation of Israel uh, and the Jewish people, but that it also welcomes in and includes uh, people uh, who are not traditionally part of Israel. It's bring, including of the Gentiles in, into mm -hmm. the story of God's redemptive purposes. So uh, I think, you know, that's reading a lot into just those two names sure. in, the, in the opening sure. verse. But it's, I think as the book develops, we see that played out. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. Do you what do you think of also reading "Son of David" and "Son of Abraham" as as kind of evoking Isaac, right, the son of Abraham, mm -hmm. and then also Solomon, who are two figures who obviously are are may pop up throughout the gospel. Yeah. What do you think of what do you think of those evocations? Are those kind of muted ones or quieter ones, or are they there as well? Um. Solomon may be a little more muted, I would say. Um, or maybe not I, there at all. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know about that. But, sure. but Isaac is quite interesting uh, okay. because uh, at the baptismal story, uh, when you have the voice from heaven saying, this is my son, the beloved, that's the same mm -hmm. language that's used of Isaac in Genesis 22 in the right. story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac. Mm -hmm. I actually had a, a doctoral student some years ago named Leroy Husengay who mm -hmm. wrote a whole book on exactly this question. Uh, yeah. the, it's entitled The New Isaac, in which he really develops that whole theme of mm -hmm. Jesus, uh, or, or of Isaac, rather, as a prefiguration of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, yeah, I think there's there's definitely something to that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, to the defense of your Solomon yeah. interpretation, <laughs> we do have Matthew twelve forty two, yeah. where Jesus says um, that something greater than and Solomon, Solomon sure. is here. So yeah. maybe, but I, I do think it's probably not as prominent yeah. as Isaac. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, let's jump to the end of the genealogy, and then we'll go back and look at a few of the names in the middle. But so the end of the genealogy. In verse 17, we get this. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. But if we actually count the names going through the genealogy, it looks like we do get 14 for the first section and the second section, but that last section from Salathiel in verse 12 to Jesus has 13 names. Uh, so... Is Matthew miscounting, or is there something else that's going on here? And then a, a second and potentially related question is if we were then to look at some of the genealogies from the Old Testament, like First, Corinthians, First Chronicles 1 to 9, uh, we could count more than 14 generations between these significant events. So what is Matthew doing? Is, is he playing fast and loose with numbers here? Uh, what's his purpose? Uh He's, I think he's certainly playing with numbers. Whether he's playing fast and loose is <laughs> another question. Uh, this, I assume that this is a traditional genealogy that Matthew has uh, derived from some source. Um, the, the three times 14 is intriguing. One of the things that scholars like to point out, there was a... A, a common interpretive device used in antiquity called gematria, which is the assigning of a numerical value to letters. So to take the English alphabet as an example, A would be one, B would be two, and so on. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Hebrew name David, the Hebrew letters for David added, given a numerical value and added up together are 14. Mm 
Mm. And, you know, scholars have, have made uh, a lot of that. I, I'm not sure that's what Matthew was trying to do, but it's, it doesn't seem entirely implausible. Uh, so there, there may be a, a little manipulation of the numbers to, to try to uh, fit that scheme. Sure. But there's, uh, you know, your question has, you put your finger on something that has generated pages and pages and pages of commentary. <laughs> and every commentary that anybody writes on Matthew, can, can Matthew not count? Right. Uh, <laughs> given, given the uh, sort of careful composition of this gospel, I, I think right. that's pretty doubtful. And the, the explanation that I have seen that I think makes the best sense is that David is mentioned twice. It's, it's in verse, at the end of verse 6, Jesse, the father of King David, and then it repeats, David, who was the father of Solomon, etc. Um, and if you count David twice and then end the second set with Josiah and mm-hmm. take Jeconiah as starting the third set, then you do get three sets of 14. Um, so that's, it seems to me that's not a perfect solution, but it at least sure. makes some sense out of Matthew's numbers game. Yeah. But maybe, not- maybe counting David twice is a hint for the gematria. So yeah. pay attention to this, this figure, and sure. I'm going to use that yeah. for the, the generations. Yeah, that's sure. possible for sure. Uh, and then the significance of segmenting the genealogy into those particular chunks. So Abraham mm-hmm. to David, David to Babylon, Babylon to the Messiah. What's going on there? Well, that, I think, in my judgment, is much clearer. Uh, from Abraham to David, you have a, a kind of uh, ascending motion uh, from the initial promise to Abraham, and which becomes formative for the people of Israel eventually, from that to the pinnacle of David's kingship. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's all downhill to the (laughs) deportation to Babylon. And then there's a kind of obscure period of waiting uh, from, and the the final phrase is um, uh, from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah. (laughs) It doesn't just say to Jesus, it's to the Messiah, which is what uh, I think Matthew wants to emphasize there. So um, the, um, uh, the the genealogy sketches the shape of the story of Israel from Abraham to the Messiah. And the, uh, the deportation to Babylon, uh, which also gets... Uh, played out a little further on in these opening chapters of Matthew is is very crucial because uh, there's a sense in which uh, Israel is still in a state of exile. Uh, They're still in a state of unfulfillment, uh, waiting for the Mm -hmm. ultimate deliverer to come. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that segmentation, I think, sketches a, a big picture of the story that Matthew sees as leading up to Jesus as its fulfillment. Hmm. Now, when we look at the names in the genealogy, there are four surprising ones in particular, right? The four women, right? We yeah. have Tamar, Ruth, Rahab, and the wife of Uriah. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- what is surprising about finding them here? And why do you think Matthew includes them in the genealogy? Right. Well, the the very fact that women are included in a patrilineal genealogy is already a surprise. Normally, you wouldn't see that. Um, And the fact that these particular women are included is what's particularly interesting. You know, why do we not have Sarah and Mm -hmm. Rebecca and, you know, women who are, in a sense, more prominent in the uh, patriarchal narratives are, are not mentioned but then these four are, uh, all of whom are, in a sense, rather minor characters. I suppose Ruth isn't a minor character. She has a whole book uh, telling her story. But the, the, they, they are they're odd choices. And a lot of attention has been given to the fact that um, in various ways, they are 
with the poss well, even even including Ruth, I think they are they are women who are connected with some sort of story about sexual irregularity. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Tamar seduces her father-in-law mm-hmm. in order to perpetuate the genealogical line, and uh, uh, Rahab is a prostitute, and Ruth. Uh, you know, sneaks into Boaz's tent and <laughs> lies down with him. And uh, and then, of yeah. course, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, uh, is uh, illegitimately claimed in an adulterous affair with David. Uh, so some people have said, why does Matthew include these women? It's to make the point that there are women of doubtful virtue who are included in the Mm -hmm. genealogical line to the Messiah. And therefore, if there's some question about Mary Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. you know, where where Jesus came from, this provides some backdrop to say, well, God is full of surprises. Um, I personally don't find that a a very compelling observation for several reasons. One is that, uh, for example, the story in the Old Testament doesn't blame Bathsheba. She's an innocent victim. David is the one who is uh, called on the carpet by mm-hmm. Nathan the prophet as having done something wrong and unjust. Um, and Tamar is uh, an example of one who is said to be more righteous than mm-hmm. uh, than the uh, father-in-law that she seduced. Uh, so th- there's, uh, I don't think that holds up very well. Um, and Ruth is of course an example of, of great faithfulness. So the, and, and well, to, to finish the, the list, Rahab is responsible for helping the uh, spies, uh, not be detected as they scout out the promised land. So all of them, in a sense, are exemplary. Um, I think so to cut to the chase, I think the more likely explanation is that all of them are Gentiles. They're they're all non-Israelites. If you think that Bathsheba is a non-Israelite, that's not exactly clear. But Mm -hmm. there there are people who are in uh, to put it in, in a sentence, they are Gentiles who become included in the genealogy of the Messiah, which suggests that ultimately God's purpose will reach out to include others outside Israel, um, and which is, again, as I've said, a, a significant theme for Matthew. Um, yeah. the, the gospel ends with the claim to make disciples of all nations, all the Gentiles. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a foreshadowing, just like the Magi who come to the uh, the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem to worship. Those are Gentiles who prefigure the entry of Gentiles right. into uh, God's people. Right. I, I, I'm with you on the. I'm, I'm with you on all that, and I, I like that you pointed out that a number of the women. Um, they're not. They're actually signaled as as virtuous, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. In the text, yeah. in the biblical text themselves. But I still wonder if if Matthew still has within his purview that there's some kind of sexual impropriety that surrounds them, whether it's due to their faults or not. Uh, the, and the reason I wonder is because when I come to verse 18, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child. It almost, for me, evokes, you know, some kind of sexual, you know, impropriety that enveloped in some way the other stories as well. But then it the narrative, I think, resolves it for us. she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And you kind of get a bit of a sigh of, ah, really? <laughs> what do you, I mean, what do you think of that? Well, I think that's right. And I mean, look at the next verse, her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man, mm-hmm. and willing to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss yeah. her quietly. And then he's yeah. warned in a dream or he's instructed in a dream 
that don't, that uh, the child is from the Holy Spirit and he should take Mary as his wife yeah. without at yeah. all. So and uh, he does it amazingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. That's right. Um, no, I, th- I think you're right. I think that that's possible. Uh, okay. I, I really think, I mean, maybe it's a both and. Sure. It, yeah. it could be a both and thing. Sure. Right. Uh, let's compare Matthew's genealogy now to Luke, because Luke also includes a genealogy, but it differs from Matthew's in a number of ways. So it goes in a different direction. It appears in a different place in the gospel. Uh, so what is Matthew doing differently with his genealogy than Luke. Uh, yeah, well, one of the, as you say, it, it, Luke goes from Jesus backwards in describing the genealogy. Uh, but it's not only the ordering, but the fact that Luke carries it all the way back to Adam. Um, and I, I think that for Luke, that is also theologically significant. Um, that uh, as in in uh, Romans five, Jesus is the new Adam. I mean, he's he's the son of Adam who sets right what Adam set wrong, as it were. Uh, so I, I think that that that's part of what Luke is up to there. Um, but um, I think for Matthew. Uh, he's much more concerned about uh, the immediate problem of continuity with the story of Israel. Um, Matthew, and of course, Matthew puts it front and center, whereas uh, Luke holds off until the baptism story uh, to introduce the genealogy. Um, so the, the 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 genealogies I think function differently. It it doesn't uh, appear quite as prominent in Luke after we've already had the birth stories uh, about Jesus in uh, Luke one and two. So um, I'm not sure. Were you thinking something else that? Uh, well, I mean, I wonder if to, to the point that you just made, Matthew kicks off with this because this is a yeah. major concern of his gospel is to show the coherence of Jesus as the Messiah with God's purposes yeah. for Israel. And right. so it's all leading up to yeah. this. It seems yeah. like Luke's genealogy, like you like you pointed out as well, is um, it functions to validate God's declaration of Jesus, which is interesting because then it traveled, you know, Jesus says this, God says, this is my son, right? Mm-hmm. At the baptism. Mm-hmm. And then it travels back all the way up to him to son. I think it's son of God is the final one. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Son of right. God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of an interesting, it's kind of like legitimizing God's declaration of Jesus right. as the son of God, which is yeah. fascinating. Now, one quick question about this, that readers, commonly have in comparing the two genealogies is that Jesus's father, Joseph, is said to be the son of Jacob in Matthew, but the son of Heli in Luke. Any um, guidance you can provide us on that? Not really, except to say that I think, as I said about Matthew, that he's probably appropriated this genealogy from some sort of traditional source. And I think the same would be true for Luke. And they're just operating with different sources. I mean, there are quite a few differences in the genealogy yeah. if you actually try to map them and compare them. Uh, just to give one example, uh, in Matthew's genealogy, he makes a point of of saying of tracing uh, the son of David as Solomon and the geneal as the genealogy through Solomon. But in Luke's. It's it's a son of David is Nathan. It says hmm. that the genealogy is traced through. So if if you try to line them up, they don't they just don't work. With the different numbers of, of people in the genealogy and hmm. uh, it, it's you know I, I think it's a mistake uh, to assume that what we're reading here is. Uh, a sort of infallible historical account. These are these are tra- pieces of tradition that are functioning in each of each Matthew and Luke uh, to make certain theological claims about the identity and mission of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And um, 
I, I have honestly, this is not something that I have worried over very much about the fact that the genealogies are not precisely the same. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we should try to come up with labored explanations to harmonize them somehow. They're just mm-hmm. two different pieces of tradition. So let's move on from the genealogy uh, to the birth of Jesus in verses 18 to 25 of chapter 1. Uh, And so in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 23, we have this angel that appears to Joseph in a dream, and he dissuades Joseph from divorcing Mary. And the angel says to Joseph in verse 21, She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And for Matthew, this fulfills Isaiah 7, 14. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So Matthew's quoting from Isaiah 7, 14, where the prophet is, this is the prophet Isaiah, and he's talking to King Ahaz, and he says, God will give you a sign that the young woman, now here in Hebrew it's Alma, which doesn't necessarily mean virgin, but this young woman will um, give birth. In Isaiah seven fourteen, in its context there, it doesn't seem to be talking of a sign or a birth beyond the time of Ahaz, or maybe you might want to suggest that it is. So how is Matthew drawing from this passage from Isaiah and then applying it to Jesus and his birth? Well, first of all, you're right that the, in the context of Isaiah, uh, it is not a prophecy about a distant future Messiah. It's a sign given immediately to King Ahaz, uh, who has, interestingly, uh, he's, gone, he's seeking guidance as to whether he should or should not engage uh, in a military uh, campaign. And uh, if in seven Isaiah 7.10, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. But then Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Uh, Which I think he doesn't want to know the answer to his question, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, So he doesn't want to. uh, This is a a kind of a theological evasion to say, I will not put the Lord to God to the test. But then Isaiah (laughs) gives him a prophecy anyway and says, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And the sign is the, the young woman, whoever that is. It's, it's what the Hebrew text says. It says young woman. It doesn't say virgin. Mm-hmm. Uh, is with child and will bear a son. You shall name him Emmanuel. And by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Uh, so the the sign is that there's to be a child. The child should be named God with us. And the, the threatening enemy kings are going to disappear from the scene. <clears throat> so up to that point, it sounds like a sign of salvation. But then look, the Lord will bring on you and your people such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So that's the the exile of the northern kingdom. Um, On that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly and so on. All these things are going to be bad things, signs of judgment Mm. that will happen to Mm. the people. Mm. So it's... to go back to your question, the, in its original context, this prophecy about the child being born to a young woman <coughs> is, on one hand, a sign of uh, deliverance and hope, but on the other hand, it's also a sign of judgment. And God with us can mean either salvation or judgment, depending yeah. on on uh, the circumstances. So. What what does that have to do with how Matthew reads the text? Um, If you'll allow me a a little sort of filling in something here, it's very important. The the Greek verb that Matthew uses in introducing this quotation is one that he 
typically uses when he cites these Old Testament passages that have been fulfilled. It's plerothe. Uh, it, all of this happened in order to fulfill that which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying. Um, now, this word fulfill, I think we are prone to misinterpret that. We, we tend to think of it in terms of a prophet making a prediction of something that will happen. Mm -hmm. But when Matthew uses it, I think characteristically it has a little different sense. The verb means literally to fill up something. The, and I think what he's saying is that the word of the prophet is filled up and given a new and fuller sense than anyone could possibly have understood before. Matthew is reading backwards. He's reading backwards and discovering a, a fuller sense in the text than its original historical meaning and a fuller sense than anyone would have understood beforehand. I, if you look at rabbinic literature, they don't interpret this Isaiah seven fourteen as a prophecy about a Messiah, mm. uh, partly because they're reading the Hebrew, which says a young woman. It doesn't say a virgin. <clears throat> Interestingly, it's the Greek translation, the Septuagint again, which introduces the word Parthenos, which means virgin. Um, and that's where we get a virgin will conceive and bear a son. So Matthew, Matthew is believing that under the guidance of the Spirit, and in light of things that have actually happened in the life of Jesus, that this prophecy has been filled up with a, a fuller sense than what it had before. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. One quick question on the Septuagint there. That's a Jewish translation into it Greek, is. right? So it is. does yeah. that give some indication that there are, that Jews were expecting something more to come, uh, that that they translated it Parthenos instead of something that more closely corresponded to just a young woman? Uh, that's a really good question, and I'm not, I, I don't actually know a good answer to that offhand. We don't really know for sure what the Septuagint translators were up to or why they uh -huh. chose that particular word. Um, I do know, of course, that the, the rabbinic sources later are scornful of Christians interpreting that as a messianic prophecy. But, of course, that's after the fact. Um, right. Whether whether there would have, you know, the the... Septuagint translation was done in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, by a, a group of scholars who were assembled for that purpose. And um, how they were reading it, I think we don't have any good attestation of what their motives might have been. Um, there, are, there are a number of texts in the Septuagint, uh, in other passages in the Prophets and Psalms, which lend themselves to um, messianic interpretation. And it may be that there, there was some expectation of the hope of a restoration of the kingship in Israel that might have driven some of this. But I'm not aware, at least, of any evidence mm. for that being a motivation behind this particular translation sure. of that passage. Sure. Thanks. Um, when Herod gets wind of the birth of the king of the Jews from the Magi, he summons the chief priests and the scribes to figure out where the Messiah would be born. And they then scour the scriptures and they cite from uh, 2 Samuel 5 or Micah 5 2. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Now, many interpreters, myself included, <laughs> when reading these first two chapters, we see a number of affinities with the story of Israel's exodus, right? With Herod being likened to Pharaoh and the slaughtering yeah. of, of the infants. Um, and 
we can come back to the resonances with the Exodus perhaps later, but you also suggest that we should think more about Second Samuel 5 and what it portends of Herod. And I think that's actually quite fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about this echo that you propose and its significance? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. This is quite interesting. Um, I mean, one of the first things that's interesting is that, that the passage from Micah that everybody always refers to, mm -hmm. do, it doesn't say what Matthew says it says. It, sa it actually says, you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, you are one of the little clans of Judah. Mm -hmm. And as Matthew quotes it, uh, it says, you are by no means least mm -hmm. among the rulers of Judah. Very, very curious you know, quirk there. I, you know, whether Matthew is perhaps quoting some alternative mm -hmm. textual version, I, I don't know. But it's, mm -hmm. it's already departing from the, what the Hebrew text says. But the, the really intriguing thing is the second part of the quotation for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. That's not in Micah. Um, it, it, it do, well, it does say uh, in Micah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. But it, it doesn't have this language about shepherding mm -hmm. that is, is present in uh, uh, this other passage from Second Samuel. Here, here's the story. Uh, so Saul, at this point in Second Samuel, it, Saul is still the king of Israel, uh, but he is not popular. And so here, here's the story. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. So they are acknowledging that even though Saul is the king, David has been de facto the one who's been an effective leader. Mm -hmm. Continuing, the Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel, who shall be ruler over Israel. And that's exactly the language that Matthew quotes. So what Matthew has given us is a, a blended quotation of uh, the passage from Micah 5 and uh, from 2 Samuel 5. Uh, the thing that's interesting about that is that it suggests, in this case, that David, who is to shepherd my people Israel, is going to supplant the king, Saul, who has been who still is uh, on the throne ruling Israel. Uh, but it's, it's a prophecy, not just about what Jesus is going to do, but it, it suggests a supplantation, a replacement mm. of the existing king. And so uh, whether, uh, <clears throat> whether, Saul, uh, whether uh, King Herod would have understood that or not, I don't know. But at least there's a, a kind of delicious uh, irony about this, <laughs> that <laughs> this prophecy in the form Matthew quotes it uh, suggests that Jesus is going to take over from Herod as the one who yeah. is the rightful king of Israel, right. the one who now, actually now, is the shepherd yeah. to the people. Yeah. Now, what you've done, Richard, is you've you've gone beyond the citation, right? When you went back to the Old Testament passage, you started looking around mm -hmm. uh, for the context beyond that that citation that Matthew uh, quotes, and you call this metalepsis, yeah. right? Can you tell us what metalepsis? Because this comes up actually in, in maybe as we discuss some of the other instances as well. Um, and it came out, it came out also, even when we talked about the women, right? I, you know, I pulled from the sexual, uh, let's say circumstances and then brought that into the way I read Mary. Tell us what metalepsis is and why it's important as we discern how Matthew interprets the old Testament. Yeah. It's, it's a technical term to describe a kind of allusion that calls upon the reader to recover the broader context of the original citation. Um, it's uh, uh, 
And a lot of allusions actually work that way. They they have force because they force they cause us to make a connection between an earlier passage and and a, a later one in ways that are significant. Um, so it's it's just that when you if you have um, a text A and text B quotes a snippet of it, the reader is meant to recall more of text A than just the piece that's quoted. Um, this, you know, this happens all the time. Um, you know, when uh, uh, an example that I give, I think, in the introduction of Echoes of Scripture in the Gospels was when uh, Barack Obama gave his acceptance speech uh, for the uh, having been uh, elected president uh, back in 2008. Uh, he echoed a, a phrase from Martin Luther King about how the arc of history uh, bends towards justice. Uh, he didn't say he was quoting Martin Luther King. He just used the phrase. But mm -hmm. if, if you if you remembered it, you would, you would see, oh, yeah, that's what he was up to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an example, now a very dated one, that... Uh, I, when I first started working on this that I used, and some of, some of your older viewers uh, here may uh, still recognize this one, uh, was that when uh, George W. Bush, not George W., the, the George, his father, the first President Bush, was uh, wanting to make a forceful point that he didn't in, intend to uh, impose further taxes, he said, read my lips no new taxes. Well, that phrase, read my lips, evoked a Clint Eastwood movie character <laughs> who was famous for being tough. And so it, it, it's, it's, the same, it's the same sort of thing that uh, right. once you start looking for it, it's all over the place in popular culture. People are alluding uh, to movies or songs or things that are part mm -hmm. of our cultural lexicon. Right. Um, and I think the New Testament writers were very much engaged in that kind of a process as they read the Old Testament. They were yeah. making well, those uh, connections. So uh, <laughs> the next one is Matthew 2, 13. And here, Matthew suggests that Jesus' escape to Egypt fulfills Hosea 11, 1, which says, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Hmm. How does Jesus going to Egypt fulfill Hosea 11, 1, which is talking about God bringing his people out of Egypt. And when it's talking about a son, it seems to be talking about the people. And it also, in the context of Hosea, doesn't seem to be a prophecy at all. It's looking back on what God had done in the past. How is, what is Matthew doing here? Well, first of all, the simple answer to part of it is that if, if Jesus is going to be fulfilling a prophecy about coming out of Egypt, he has to go to Egypt first. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the way I've understood it. It's just that the sure. prophecy is fulfilled because he, he, his family took him to Egypt initially. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing is that it's interesting that the Hosea passage refers to Israel as my son. Um, the is Israel is uh, the people of God is referred to as God's son. That that that's happens in Exodus four as well. Um, so the Jesus as the son of God is taking on himself the role of being representative of the people Israel. I think that's part of the significance of, of Matthew's claim there. Jesus. Uh, steps into the role of Israel. He's, he's the new Israel who renders the kind of full obedience that Israel had failed to, to give in the past. Um, the other thing is that, that that passage in Hosea is actually a, a prophecy referring not only to the past, to Israel's deliverance out of Egypt, but also to the end of Israel's exile. Uh, it, when you get uh, down to the end of it, God God has pronounced judgment on uh, His Son, 
uh, Israel because of their disobedience. But then in verse 8, there's a turn. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. And it ends with a prophecy that the children will come trembling from the West like birds and return to their home. It's prophecy of the end of exile. Uh, so Matthew, I think, is has multiple layers of significance that he's finding in that uh, quotation. It refers to the original exodus out of Egypt. It refers to the end of Israel's exile, which is a past event for Matthew. And it refers now also to Jesus, whose geographical movement recapitulates and somehow mm-hmm. fulfills that prophecy. I'm curious, I'm curious what you think of my attempt to uh, to do the metalepsis here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, in Hosea 11, you have out of Egypt, I called my son, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's 11.1. That's out of Egypt. Mm-hmm. Then in verse 5, they shall return to the land of Egypt. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there seems yeah. to be an out of Egypt, then a return into Egypt. And then as you pointed out, uh, if we skip on down to verse, uh, where is it? Yeah, verse 10, uh, verse 11, probably 11. That's right. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt. So what, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that Hosea 11 itself contains an out of Egypt into Egypt, out of Egypt motif. Yeah. And I wonder if Matthew is picking up on this because he's just evoked Herod as a Pharaoh slaughtering, you know, the infants just as Pharaoh does in the book of yeah. Exodus. Yeah. And so in a sense, when the, I wonder if the reason why he places the fulfillment quotation as Jesus is going into Egypt is because he's also going out of Egypt, wink, wink, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Out of Israel, which he's now depicted as though it's, it's like Egypt. So he's coming out of Egypt. He goes into Egypt, which then means he'll come out again. So uh, what do you think of that that suggestion? Does that, does that seem plausible, or is that kind of reading too many layers of significance into the metalepsis? I guess too many layers, but are you saying that Israel itself is the Egypt that Jesus is coming right. out of? Right, and then it functions in two ways, because then he'll also come out of Egypt geographically, like you mentioned as well. Um, I'm not sure I... Like that suggestion, <laughs> okay. suggestion of Matthew. Uh, okay, I, I think Matthew. Um, I think I, I mean the double level thing is very clear in the Hosea. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king. So mm-hmm. the, you know, there's there's already the reference to the original Egyptian captivity, right. and then to the to the exile where Assyria yeah. is. Is yeah. uh, the ruler, um, but whether the, whether Israel itself is being identified as Egypt, I, I don't quite see that. I think that would make Matthew uncomfortable. Okay, that's okay. my my read. <laughs> sure, but, sure, yeah, yeah. But I yeah. do think you're right to want to read the passage metaleptically. That is to see all of yeah. at least verses one to eleven in Hosea as being. Uh, drawn into the field of significance here by this quotation, but but you don't think that I that uh, if we read Herod as a pharaoh like figure slaughtering mm-hmm. the ba- you know the babies, what, oh, I, yes. I guess what I'm suggesting is that that shifts the frame so that we are talking about Egypt in a way. Oh, that is interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I don't know. But okay, I don't know. <laughs> okay, why not? <laughs> All right, when Herod massacres the children in the area of Bethlehem, Matthew says that these words from Jeremiah were fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Now, this is a grim part of the story. How and why does Matthew cite this text from Jeremiah? First of all, I think a lot of people, me included, until I started looking it up, don't know what it means, why it says a voice in Rama. Mm-hmm. But Rama is, was the staging ground from where the 
uh, people uh, of Judea were assembled to be sent off into exile, into the Babylonian exile. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's already interesting that the, the, the prophecy uh, by associating Rachel with Rama has connected her to the exile. Um, but let me see. I'm, the, the other thing that I think, since we're being brief, that's really significant about this is that this quotation comes from Jeremiah 31, which is precisely the chapter in Jeremiah, which prophesies a new covenant. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the, in fact, the, Jeremiah 31 explicitly talks about hope for the future. Uh, so even though it's a certainly what Matthew is describing here is a, a grim atrocity uh, being perpetrated by Herod, uh, Matthew links it with this theme of exile. And particularly if we keep reading in Jeremiah 31, uh, we get to the days are surely coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah and so on. Um, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And it, this same passage also refers to God taking them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt mm -hmm. and so on. So the, it, it links once again, both with the uh, Egyptian captivity and the Exodus and the end of exile. And when Matthew connects it here to Herod's massacre, uh, he's also suggesting that uh, Israel can look forward to a future uh, redemption and being called out of bondage and into freedom. Okay, last one. Uh, at the end of the chapter, Joseph takes his family up to Galilee and he makes his home in a town called Nazareth. And so Matthew writes, he does this so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled he will be called a Nazarene. Yeah. So which prophet is Matthew citing here? Where do we, are, are we going to be able to flip back to the Old Testament like we did with these other passages and look at the surrounding context to try and figure this one out? What do we do with this one? <clears throat> this one has baffled scholars who've been arguing about this forever <clears throat> because there isn't any passage in the Old Testament that says exactly what Matthew quotes here, that he shall be called a Nazarene. Technical point that I think is interesting. Matthew's introduction of this quotation is different from his other fulfillment quotations. Typically, he says uh, this happened so that what had been spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, uh, saying Legontes mm -hmm. is the Greek that introduces the quote of uh, actual quotation. This one doesn't do that. It says so that what had been spoken through the prophets, plural, not the prophet. And then it, he doesn't have the saying. He just has in the, in the Greek, literally, it says what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled that he will be called a Nazarene. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's significant because it suggests that Matthew doesn't even think he is actually introducing a literal quotation at that point. Uh, it's some sort of a, um, you know, it's an indirect discourse paraphrase of some kind. The scholars are all over the place on what this should refer to. Does it, re there's a, is it, does it refer to Samson? Samson being a Nazirite? Mm -hmm. Not a not a Nazarean, but a Nazirite is a, mm -hmm. you know, a person set aside by a special vow of holiness. Uh, is it referring to Isaiah eleven one, the passage that says a branch or a, 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 a sprout shall spring forth from the root of Jesse? Uh, Isaiah eleven is <clears throat> commonly interpreted by later Christian tradition as a messianic prophecy. Uh, and the the word in Hebrew for uh, this branch or sprout is netzer, and you know is is the word Nazarite somehow uh, or, or Nazarene is it somehow derived from that word that means sprout? 
Uh, there, there's just any number of hypotheses, but it's all guesswork. Nobody knows, mm-hmm. really. And, of course, in its context in Matthew, it's connected to the fact that Jesus' home turns out to be Nazareth. So mm-hmm. the, the Nazarean is at the literal surface level of the text referring to he's, that's his hometown. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like saying, uh, you know, he's a um, Atlantan or something. If he's right. from yeah. Atlanta. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, it's, um, it, it's, there's probably some kind of punning allusion to some of these other passages, mm-hmm. which can be read messianically. Uh, but it's, it's really a difficult problem and I don't have an easy answer to it. All right. Um, maybe there's one last question that I think would be, is a, would be really good to get Richard to unpack for us briefly, which is Richard, you've, your book is on echoes of scripture in the gospels and you, you look at all four gospels. Um, could you tell us if you see anything particularly distinctive about how Matthew uses and evokes uh, scripture and finds it fulfilled in Jesus? Yes. I mean, one of the main points of the book is that you have to read each gospel individually and look at their uses of scripture, which are in some ways convergent, but in other ways, interestingly different from one another. Uh, this this whole emphasis on this these fulfillment texts this happened in order to fulfill what was written by the prophet that's very distinctive to Matthew it, it doesn't really occur very much if at all in the other gospels in the same way um, Matthew is very concerned to show from start to finish how the eventual Gentile mission turns out to be a fulfillment of Israel's story. And Matthew, much more than other Gospels, is very concerned to try to explain uh, the the meaning of different events and quotations. Uh, he's uh, there. One of my favorite descriptions that I've encountered of Matthew is that it's an instruction manual for prophets, which seems like a, a paradoxical description, but but Matthew, it's, it's very didactic gospel. He's mm-hmm. trying to make everything as clear as possible, set forth Jesus as the great teacher. Matthew sets the Sermon on the Mount front and center as the first major block of discourse from Jesus. Um, and so, yes, the the... Uh, and and ultimately, the, the way that Matthew drives the story towards the Gentile mission, with Jesus at the very end saying, I'm with you always to the end of the age, and instructing the disciples that they, uh, that his disciples, that they should go and make disciples of all nations, um, and promising his presence till the end of the age. All, all of that is... That's pure Matthean stuff that sets it significantly apart from the other Gospels. Um, so, whereas Mark, by contrast, is very mysterious and evasive uh, in the way that he appropriates the Old Testament. But Matthew wants to make it as clear as possible. Great. Well, the last question that we have for you is one that we ask all of our guests, which is if you could take a stab at this genre that biblical scholars seem to have perfected, which is the blurb. You know, we're constantly blurbing on different people's books, Um, but it doesn't have to be about a book. It could be about anything uh, that you've um, that's caught your fancy recently that you think our listeners and viewers might find helpful. So it could be a book, but it could be a TV show or a movie or a life hack or whatever. Anything that you'd recommend? Yeah. Uh, Can I do more than one? Sure. Go for it. (laughs) Um, the the uh, the movie that has most recently en- engrossed me <clears throat> and caught my fancy is uh, Peter Jackson's astonishing eight hour reissue of the footage of the Beatles preparing to record Get Back and do that rooftop concert. Eight hours of back. <laughs> I, I, part of it is I love the Beatles, but the other part of it is it's fascinating to see how the creative process unfolds mm. over time, mm-hmm. the interaction of the different personalities of mm. the four of them and the conflicts and how they work it out in the end. It's, mm. it's great fun. But on a more serious note, I have uh, 
two things I wanted to mention. One is a very recent book that's just come out called The Bible and Baptism uh, Mm -hmm. by uh, uh, Isaac Morales. Uh, Isaac is a a Catholic monk and priest uh, who has written uh, about the way in which baptismal imagery runs throughout scripture and particularly his discussion of the role of water in the old testament as a poetic figure of life death freedom and purity is is really quite Mm. extraordinary and uh it's 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 of course you know he's it's a very roman catholic book uh for your protestant readers but he he does a lot with the, what we've been talking about also, which is the way the Old Testament can be read figurally as foreshadowing or prefiguring the New Testament view of baptism. The other thing I just mentioned is uh, 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 this is a book very few of your uh, viewers, I expect, will know. It's a book called The Parthenon uh, by George Hobson. It's a collection of poetry. Uh, mm-hmm. George is an amazing Christian poet uh, uh, who has just late in life, he's now in his 80s, but he's he started publishing some of his poetry. And uh, I, I wrote the foreword to the book, but it's a, it's mm-hmm. a, a marvelous uh, depiction. And I would say even if readers just want to start with the one poem called The Parthenon, I think it's really mm-hmm. a, a moving piece of work. Great, but an appropriate allusion back to our discussion of Parthenos and <laughs> the LXX of Isaiah 714. Great. I, I have recently moved to Nashville, and I live less than a mile from the oh, yeah. place in, in the, a park in Nashville where they've reconstructed a full-scale model of the Parthenon. So perhaps that mm. is a, a coincidence. Yeah, I've been there before. It's quite a place. And why they decided to do that, I'm not sure. But uh, it's neat to see if you can't travel all the way to Greece. So, yeah. Well, Richard, thanks for taking the time to walk us through this journey through Matthew 1 to 2. And uh, for those of you listening, thanks for tuning in to the Two Testaments. If you enjoyed this uh, episode, uh, you can find us at thetwotestaments.com, and please jump on Apple Podcasts, give us a rating. Ideally, your your best five-star rating will we'll take. I just feel like that will fulfill some prophecy somewhere yes. if someone gives us a five-star rating. It also helps our listeners. Uh, it helps find people find the show if we yes. have helpful ratings. They shall be called a generous five-star <laughs> That great citation somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Richard. We really do appreciate it. Good to talk with you guys. The Two Testaments is produced with support from Sanford University, where Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes are professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Thanks to you, our fellow travelers, who support this journey by donating on our website, thetwotestaments.com. Thanks also to Cam Thomas, Joe Zeldner, and the team in the Sanford Faculty Success Center and our student assistants for their help with production, editing, and promotion. Thank you.